Welcome to this week's segment of Dialogue Houston. I'm your host, Lawrence Payne. To our regular viewing audience, welcome. To those joining us perhaps for the first time here for HCC's TV Dialogue Houston, we're here now every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 a.m. and again at 6 p.m., Saturday afternoons at 3 p.m. As always, on top of the hour, let me thank you very much for your calls, text messages, and emails concerning previous shows we've aired here on HCC's TV Dialogue Houston, where after all, this is your community affairs, public affairs show now in its 27th season. Particularly, we want to make sure that you continue to give us those great ideas for guest topics and subjects to be covered on upcoming, upcoming segments of Dialogue Houston, because we know in the times we live in these days, we have a lot to talk about and a lot of issues, and the myriad of issues are quite long. Uh, we have a great show planned for you in this segment. I'm calling this kind of a special edition of Dialogue Houston. You've heard me talk about it in the last few weeks and months in various ways on the show. You've heard me reference, talk about the Mayor's Task Force on Policing Reform. The Mayor's Task Force on Policing Reform. This is the report. This is the document. It is here. BERT has been given. It is now handed over to the Mayor and it is public. It is now in the public domain. Uh, it is a wonderful document. All hundred and so many pages. And I'll let the I'm teasing on the pages and the length of the recommendation on purpose. Uh, in a minute, we'll talk about that. Uh, but before I do anything, I want to stop and introduce our two guests who are going to be uh, part of this great discussion this afternoon. Uh, they are intricate to the success of this document, of being not only producing it, but getting it out in the wonderful form that it is. And they are none other than Brooke Schuler and our wonderful friend, Ellen Wilcox. Uh, and we're going to let them introduce themselves. Brooke is going to go first, and then Ellen, and then we'll dive in. Brooke, it's all yours. Okay, great. Thank you, Larry. Um, so I am Brooke Schuler. I'm from Houston originally, um, but just recently graduated from the Kellogg School of Management up in Evanston, Illinois, um, just outside of Chicago. And um, I have been working with Larry and the fellow 45 um, community-led task force since June. Um, serving in the role of chief of staff and helping everyone kind of get organized, do the research, and then really help everyone pull this uh, report together and get it over the finish line. Hi there, I'm Ellen Wilcox. I am also a recent graduate from the Kellogg School of Management uh, from the dual degree in design engineering program. Brooke and I were colleagues and dear friends from that experience. I uh, am so grateful to have served as lead designer and editor in this process of pulling together the report. Brooke looped me in for the last month of the sprint, which involved taking what was an incredible amount of work and organizing it, synthesizing it, and presenting it in a way that was readable and useful not only for the mayor and the mayor's team, but also the greater Houston community. So being a part of that discussion and how we really bring these words and these ideas to life was um, something that I was fascinated by and so energized by and working with Larry and Brooks together, I think was probably the most energizing part of that. I am by nature a, a design thinker and design strategist and I will be joining um, IDEO Consulting as a business designer uh, actually next week. So this was a wonderful way to bring uh, my background together with my goals. So thanks Brooke for looping me in. And thank you, Ellen. And thank you, Brooke. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I like what Ellen said, bringing words to life, because that's really what it's all about. So the 45-member task force appointed by Mayor Sylvester Turner, as we well know, and they gave him, uh, given a charge of 90 days, and great charge that he gave us. He gave us the outline that we needed to begin our work. Uh, 45 members of the task force came together, and we had a wonderful committee structure. Uh, and the committee co-chairs I want to name because they're an intricate part to what we did, Dr. Carla Bradley, Lacey Wolf. Mamie Garcia, Linda Kincaid, Dr. Howard Henderson, C Cesar Espinoza, Bobby Singh, and Kurt uh, Watson. Uh, it's a team effort. It was a wonderful team effort that produced the document that I was holding up a minute ago. I'm always trying to hold this document up. It is 153 pages, 104 recommendations, 
Uh, and this, let me give you the, con, the, the little context of the text real quick. And then I'm gonna jump into our conversation with, with both Brooke and Ellen. Uh, the task force report is divided into six sections, community uh, policing, independent oversight, power dynamics, crisis intervention, field readiness, and clear expectation. Those six areas are colored, colored coded throughout the document so that you can follow very easy the process of each one of them and the progress of each one. There are another piece that goes with that. We call them kind of the five overarching pieces that helps you explain the six. They are a definition of each section, an overview, the recommendations themselves, the key takeaways, and accountability timeline for each section. If you add up the six sections and you add up the five overlays, that gives you 11. There's a 12th component. Of the 11, the 12th component is you, the citizen, the Houstonian, and the role you play in the implementation of this document. This is a community document. It was put together in, with intentionality and mindfulness to be a readable community document that everyone could take hold of. It is built on understanding of relationships of mutual trust and respect. In some cases that have to be established, some have to be reestablished, and some have to be developed from scratch. And why is that so important? Because nothing happens without trust. Nothing happens without trust. And so as we took on this responsibility very seriously, the 45 members, uh, co-chairs of the committees, and then myself as the role of the chair of the uh, task force. I explained this to a friend of mine about how this task force processes work. Uh, he came back to me and said, you know what this sounds like to me? I said, what? He said, you had a captain, that was you. You had a, nav a navigator, that was Brooke. And you had a pilot, that was Ellen. <laughs> I said, okay, captain, navigator, and pilot. I said, let me think about that for a moment. So as I thought about that for a moment, uh, it's very true. Uh, the Canada leader and the chair, uh, who hopefully leads by example, helps the team develop, uh, develops other leaders, uh, tries to take care of himself or herself in the process, embraces vulnerability, uh, goes the extra mile, is open to feedback, to act it out of work. The navigator, our wonderful navigator, Rook, the chief of staff, and who kind of helped us all pull together, helps plan the journey, ensuring ha hazards are avoided as we go, <laughs> researching all charts and publications to make sure we're on the right track. Uh, I said, okay, that fits. And if anybody knows anything about navigation and about seafaring stuff, the captain who may be great on the open sea of steering and piloting the ship needs the navigator to make sure the charts and graphs are right, that we're going the right way. But when you get down to the end, when you get near the harbor, I don't care how great of a captain you are, you got to call on the harbor pilot who steers you into port, who maneuvers the document to where it needs to get. <laughs> who is an expert at size and shapes to maneuver the document properly, who possesses a knowledge of a particular kind to help you craft the words and the words to give life to the words, as Ellen said. So I guess in many ways, the analogy of the captain, the navigator, and the pilot does fit. So with that said, let's talk about each one of our roles and what we did to help bring this wonderful document uh, to see. I'm going to go last because that's what a leader does. I'm a servant leader, so first is last and last is first. Uh, so, Brooke, if you would kind of lead us off, first of all, in a larger context, let's talk about it in this way. What led both of you, and you touched on it briefly in, in your introductions of yourselves, but what led you to want to be involved with something around police reform of all the topics and subjects, uh, to be involved with something known as police reform? Why did you get into it? What excited you about it? What made you, as you got deeper into it, feel that this was actually the thing to be doing at this time? And what kind of guided you throughout this process? Brooke? Yeah, so I was reflecting back on that once we wrapped everything up yesterday. Um, and I realized that Ellen and I both attended um, one of the early George Floyd protests in Chicago. Um, and we were there together marching. And what really struck me afterwards was the engagement and the follow up from fellow Kellogg students. Because sometimes when you go to marches like that, you, you march and you kind of feel like, oh, I did my part, I'm done. But one of our friends um, really challenged us to be there, not just for that one march, but to be there every day. 
and to be there advocating for people who need it every single day. And I guess I had not been personally challenged with that before. I hadn't been called out, not in a bad way, but just opened my eyes to, you know, where the need was. And so that night I was thinking to myself, like, what else could I be doing? And I thought about applying this business skill set and this ability to do the design thinking methods that Ellen mentioned to policing reform. Um, because I noticed how much of an impact it can make with our clients. Um, and those clients, you know, range from like consumer goods to restaurants to retail, but it can completely also encompass um, government agencies and groups like police. And so I was thinking to myself, I literally stayed up, I couldn't fall asleep because I was like, I know exactly the types of skills that I could bring to the table to help with this issue. Um, and so that's kind of where it all began for me. I was thinking, I have the time. My job was pushed back because of COVID. So why not bring, you know, a skill set that's needed um, at a time when I have the time to do it? Perfect. Thank you. Ellen? Well, my simple answer is that I would do just about anything Brooke ever asked me to do, <laughs> in particular, if it means that we get to partner together, which was truly a treat. Um, but I think a lot of, of, to me, this was a, an outlet that I was looking for for a long time. Um, similar to Brooke, I had a bit of time before I started work, um, and I recently have found the words of John Lewis um, to be a helpful reminder of why I'm doing this, which, was, which is if you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, that you have a moral obligation to do something about it. And I think those words absolutely describe my journey um, in a, between George Floyd's murder and where we are today. And um, I think that I've felt this strong pull of obligation, but not really had a productive outlet for it. And so for me, Brooke's call to be able to actually bring what skills and talents I possess and have invested in in these last two years, years of graduate school to an issue I've, that has kept me up at night and that I have continually had to confront in my own life and notions of safety, which are inherently fluid and um, not similar for everyone, um, that was a perfect calling for me. It was the wonderful home to this, this feeling of obligation, as John Lewis notes. And I think for me, answering that call was one of the easiest. I didn't even know what it was, but immediately I said yes to Brooke. Um, and boy, has it given me um, so much more than I ever asked for. It was wonderful to be able to give to it, but I got a lot more out of this experience than I gave. You know, we say that all change is linguistic, and it really is. So the ability to dialogue, converse, have conversations, compromise, negotiations, all those things. But words matter, actions matter, and commitment and accountability really matter. So in this world that we live in today, to have two exceptionally bright young people like you uh, to commit to this process and understand not only the context and the text of why you're committing to it and what does it mean in your own personal life and also what it means to the society as a whole. I think it's a major contribution and I thank you both and applaud you both uh, for signing on. Uh, I am a much richer person for having worked with both of you and knowing both of you uh, and we'll continue to develop that relationship as we go forward uh, and looking to see where it may lead us all as we go through our networks and connectivity. But I think the thing that it says is that this is possible. I think sometimes people put barriers in age and, and, and race between individuals and human beings that are so unnecessary because all it takes is to get to know each other. We were all strangers. We had never met each other. Uh, we had a couple of people in common, uh, in the case of Brooke and I. Uh, but other than that, it was a random kind of the, the workings of how things in life really works uh, when you people and people, new people meet, connect, and work together. Uh, it is about the spirit of the human being. It is about the quality and the nature of the human being. Uh, it is about the character and integrity stuff that we talk about and then sometimes want to poo-poo on the side. Oh, yeah, it matters, but it really doesn't matter. Well, yeah. yes, it does matter. And it matters immensely. Uh, and, and Brooke and I have talked a lot about that. And then when you work with 45s exceptional in their own way and to the strong personalities, uh, the phrase that always comes of uh, herding cats together, well, it's more than hurting cats. It's realization of their strong beliefs, personalities, their experiences. And here's what we all have said. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, fact, and perspective and viewpoint. They're not entitled to their own fact. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, perspective, and viewpoint, but not their own fact. 
And I think it was important to kind of weed out and all this other stuff that we were doing because everybody's, and this is what came through through the task force. It's true of life and it's true of the issue around policing. It really depends on each person's daily lived experiential reality. Our daily lived experiential realities are all different. Not better than, not more than, not less than, just different. Problem with society, with human beings, we can't just leave it at that. My idea has to be better. My experience has to be more richer. My idea, da, 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 da. So Brooke, tell us about this, this process that we entered into, uh, you and I, and you kind of the, the daily person. It really, we were able to get all those people to kind of begin to look at each other and look at the issues and listen more importantly to each other, but more importantly to hear, not just listen, but to hear each other as we went forward. Yeah, I think that it started out with really good organization. So Larry, you had done a really wonderful job of selecting who was going to be the co-chairs. And that wasn't something that I really thought too much about initially, but then I realized that the people that you picked were the ones that were very passionate about certain topics or were experts in that area or had experience, you know, managing large groups of people, whether through government experience or serving in the private sector. And so picking those leaders, um, I think was an essential, an, an essential first part. Um, and then the other things that we did was we did start out with an in-person meeting, which I think during COVID is actually a pretty big deal. <laughs> yes, um, very big deal. <laughs> We took a lot of precautions. We had people sitting at their own six foot table. Everyone wore masks. It, it is hard to get to know people in that kind of setting. Um, but we did try every effort of making sure people could learn more about each other. I had put together bios and um, backgrounds on everyone beforehand. We had our co-chairs come up and, and share their interests and their background and encourage people to come work on their committee. Um, so it really felt like an invitation almost to come to these different committees and bring people's own individual experiences and thoughts. And I think we were reflecting the other day with the co-chairs um, what made this process work so well. And it was having those diverse viewpoints because, you know, some of the co-chairs didn't have as deep of a background on their subject matters, but they had people join their committee and really help push the dialogue forward. And so you could get this balance of expertise and um, curiosity. So like the people who didn't know as much about it were able to ask really important questions that to the experts that maybe they hadn't even thought of before. Um, so it was just a really great dynamic. And then you just need that person, um, you know, taking notes and synthesizing all of it. And so I think when you have that great combination, it works pretty well. And Ellen, as you received the first draft of this crazy documents, <laughs> with all these words and all these directional things going in different things and able to, as an editor, begin to look at it with book as the other editor and pulling it together. What did you first see? Because you said something interesting to me in the very first conversation we had after you gave it the preliminary read, that you saw something on, uh, immediately in the pattern, that there was a flow connection and pattern there. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I if I had to explain my experience with taking it from a groups of words to bringing it to a more visual place, one anecdote stands out in particular. And I think it does a nice job of reflecting the attitudes of this group and why it works so well. Um, was before, once we kind of had done the initial read through, I came up with four different potential visual routes. Mm -hmm. Wildly different. The goal was to show <laughs> divergence um, and that you had your kind of typical professional mayoral report. So on one end, we had kind of the classic navy and gold seal. Everything was polished and prim and proper and clean. And on the other end, we had kind of more organic shapes and there was a sense of urgency and progress and not polished at all. Um, and the goal was to bring divergence to the group to say, Larry, Brooke, what do you all think? And I think that moment was one that represented to me the courage and commitment of this group to bring something different to the table that would really honor the words and ideas and the toughness and the abstraction and the stickiness of these challenges and the nuances. And we were always committed from start to end uh, to actually letting our message ring true and not diluting it for the sake of polish or for the sake of completion. 
And I think there was a real magic in being comfortable that the three of us and, and by extension, the task force overall to really embracing that visual design. And it really did make the editing process and the synthesis process clear because it was from the bottom up, not the top down. The design we went with was called grassroots. And there's meaning in that. It started with the community. It started with Houstonians. The presence of Houstonian perspectives and quotes throughout the report is in incredibly intentional. And I think that anecdote is very specific, but I think it does a nice job of explaining those common threads across all of the 104 were the people. And Brooke and I have trained ourselves to look for that because we're human-centered design thinkers. But it was obvious that this was a, a report grown from the ground up. It was the people coming together to speak. It was the 45 task force members, not the mayor directing from the top down. Um, and that really made it a joy to construct visually. And it made the editing process so much easier. And we all learned from each other. And Ellen told me the name of the visual outlay uh, being grassroots. Uh, it automatically struck on, in my thinking, but what I wanted the front page of the book to be is to quote this in the entrance of city hall chambers of the city council, the city is the people. Uh, and so it really kind of all comes together when you think about it. In the time we have left, uh, uh, Brooke and Ellen both, let's shift gears to, we have the document, it's uh, there, it's printable, it's readable, it's concise, it's uh, homework, it's done, researched, it's documented, it's best practices, is everything you would want to get engaged and be knowledgeable or become knowledgeable about policing reform, but now we have to engage the community. Now comes the real work implementation, engagement of the community. We've done some things with the document to help lead one into that process to feel part of that connectivity and involvement as a citizen. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about that. There's many things that citizens can do and how they can help develop the movement around this and get engaged. Let's speak to those from your perspective uh, first and I'll come back and add a, add a couple of things. I'm thinking through um, our different recommendations. I think part of it can simply be reading it and participating in the, in the dialogue that you talked about that was so important. I think another part of it is talking with your city council representatives, making sure that they're reading it and agreeing to um, some of the recommendations because that's how we're gonna get reform made as if um, our leadership hears from the citizens and the community and, and makes those changes. Um, I think another part is staying informed on what's being done. Um, that's why we have those accountability timeframes at the end of each section so that we have a sense on when we should be checking in with our leaders in Houston um, to make sure that movement is actually happening, to make sure that this report is not sitting on a shelf. Um, I think one other thing that Larry, you mentioned in the press conference was this um, dashboard that City Hall is working on yes. that will really yeah. allow um, civilians to engage with HPD and our leadership. And so um, I hope that we'd be able to post this document there too, so that it's easy to check in on the reforms and what the status is of each one. Yeah, that's going to be very important. Uh, before I speak to that uh, real quick, Ellen, you want to add anything on this, on this point? Yeah, I absolutely agree with Brooke. And I would only add one thing, and that is to courageously embrace these topics of discussion within your own space. I think that these policing affects us all, public safety affects us all in every industry and in every corner of town and every neighborhood. Um, and I think not being afraid to, to think about how we might own these issues in our own right is yet another step we can take in addition to all of those wonderful outlets Brooke talked about. Perfect, perfect. So this is what I'm gonna ask of us, our listening audience and the public and Houstonians and everyone. And uh, if you go to the Houston Chronicle uh, editorial yesterday, uh, you'll get a feel for where they stand on this document, along with the article they have written about the release of the task force. Uh, if you go to Channel 2, you can view the whole uh, press conference in its totality. And we want you all to download the document. Uh, it's now available on almost any of the TV stations' uh, links. It's on the Houston Chronicle link. You can find it under City of Houston Boards and Commissions. If you go to City of Houston, click on Board and Commissions. There's a link under there. But I want, we, we, we need now, whether one sees themselves in the roles that we play in our lives uh, in a democratic society as a citizen, a citizen, a congregant, <laughs> constituent, a consumer, a customer, whatever you see yourself, all of that plays into it. And we definitely need those who 
understand that there is a humanity piece of this in the fair and ethical treatment of all human beings. We need those who reside uh, in some place of worship, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, church, parish, temple, synagogue, a mosque, doesn't matter, it's all the same, to, to, to get into the moral imperative piece of this and why it's important as we, as Estonians, figure out what that baseline of how we're gonna treat all human beings fair and equally. What does that look like, feel like, act like? And how we begin to work toward that? Uh, what do we wanna be known for? What do we wanna stand for? The document gives us a way out, gives us a way forward. It gives us a way to talk about this. It helps us with words. A lot of people struggle with words of how to describe this. Well, we give you the words of how to describe this. We give you how to talk about it. And so it's very important to do all of that and there are some quick things I want to kind of move in towards the wrap up here because we're getting close to out of time. There's some truisms that fit this thing so well. And one of them is the thing from Arthur Schopenhauer. Uh, all truth passes through three stages. It is first ridiculed. Secondly, it's violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as being self-evident. So we know that we have to, that this document is going to have to go through that same process. So let's hurry up and go through the process so we can get to the self-evident part. And to help us do that, there are many things that can help us do that. There's a wonderful exhibit now called Say Their Names Memorial, Say Their Names Memorial at the Emancipation Park here in Houston on Emancipation Boulevard. Uh, a suggestion we gave at the press conference, I'll reiterate it here, picked up in the Chronicle also. Copy the document, download the document, the whole document. Get in your car, truck, put the document in your passenger seat. Go to the exhibit, the memorial, visit the memorial. After you visit the memorial, go find you a quiet place, sit down and read the document. Because visiting the memorial will give you the context you need to read the text and to be able to better understand the text. It is very important. And lastly, I'm going to ask Brooke to read uh, something from the document itself that says it all about what we want you to do and what we do not want you to do when it comes to the document. Brooke, would you please do that before, before we, a little time we have left? At the end of the day, we, the members of this community-led task force, stand united with each other in support of positive change in policing. There are over 100 recommendations included in this report. To sit back and pick apart one or two is to miss the point. As many leaders have already noted, it is far too easy for people from both sides, the community and the police, to hide behind cynical sound bites, incendiary social media posts, or provocative headlines. Rising above these all too easy, idle responses will take hard work, but it is necessary work, good work. And that kind of says it all, people. Uh, Brooke, Ellen, thank you so much. This document would have not been able to brought to fruition without your help and assistance and your humanity, your love, your patience, your commitment, dedication to this, and we thank you. And the citizens of Houston, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna continue to follow thank this. We're not going anywhere. We're all gonna be here. Uh, Rook and I just talked again this morning. We're here on the impl implementation stage with the mayor and with the co-chairs of the task force, and we're gonna see the implementation process through. They're telling me I gotta get out of here, so I'm gonna ask us all three to end together with our motto of the wonderful task force, which is, a safe city for all. If we do not go deep, we will not go far. And so people, we give you the document, put it in your hands, read it, study it, reflect on it, meditate on it, be called to action of the parts that you can get involved with. And we look forward to continuing this dialogue with you. I have to get out of here for now. So until then, as always, please stay safe, be well. And until we come together again, peace, power, and love. Mm -hmm.